Hi, welcome everybody to Navy Services Family Line Global Core Event. Tonight, we're very excited to share with you our presentation of emergency preparedness. It is not just about the weather. I have three amazing women joining me tonight as our guest speakers. The first one we have with us is Sarah Schmidt, and she is the emergency disaster worker and emergency preparedness trainer for the Salvation Army. We have Rihanna Caldwell, who is the Incident Command Systems Instructor, making sure I'm getting this all correct, ladies. And last but certainly not least, we have Pam Phillips joining us, and she is an accredited financial counselor and a military financial readiness specialist. So we're very excited to have you ladies with us tonight. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules. This is a very important topic, certainly as we head into the summer with all the fun weather events that take place. But a reminder, it's not always just about the weather. So without further ado, I am going to turn the event over to Sarah. So Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Stacy. Okay, we're going to jump into our screen here. Hopefully. Here we go. This is an emergency preparedness presentation and to see how ready you actually are and the areas that we can all work on to improve to become more ready. I am Sarah Schmidt and Stacy already told you we have two other speakers, Rihanna Caldwell and Pam Phillips. I am an emergency disaster worker and trainer. I've been with the Salvation Army for about six and a half years and have been providing presentations, um, workshops, and preparedness seminars from the Pacific through the Atlantic. I am CERT certified, a CISM trained, and a psychological first aid trainer that go along with those courses. Um, I have a background in health and human services and my master's in crisis and response trauma. I've been with CORE since 2008, and I'm so excited to be a part of this presentation um, because I love emboldening military spouses, military families, and I love to be able to help with the tools and assets they need for their growth and development. So thank you as you are joining us tonight and, and prepared to go along with us. First of all, this presentation is by military spouses for military spouses to help aid and educate you for your own readiness in times of emergency with a focus being on preparedness. This is not a fix all by any means um, for it's a baseline to help you prepare for emergencies, whether natural or man made. I encourage you to take notes screenshots and start thinking of how you can prepare in your current locales for emergencies you might encounter. We look forward to your comments and feedback at the end of this presentation and hope you'll be motivated to make the difference in your own families and communities by becoming prepared. Brief learning objectives. We're going to go over why you need to be prepared, especially as military families. We're going to detail some essentials that you need for staying at home, for going to a shelter, for your animals, and what a disaster kit looks like. We're going to review vital documents, how you should handle those, where they need to be at, and how accessible they are to you. We're going to discuss ways to build resiliency through preparedness training and the financial implications of not being forward ready. And then at the end, we're going to have a list of resources, registration sites, and recommendations that we highly encourage you to utilize. Moving forward, there are several misconceptions that we all fall for, and it often gives us a false sense of safety. Maybe you'll think of some of these and some of them you've already thought or maybe you've said, um, but it's just a test siren. Just ignore it. It'll be over soon. No biggie. Most emergencies are short lived. I won't deal with an emergency where I live. I'm perfectly safe here. There are a lot of emergencies I can't prepare for, so I don't know. Preparing takes too much time or I can do it later. The military will take care of me. I live on base or my active duty spouse will come home and help us through. But then who was prepared? Was anybody prepared for the shortages that we would face when pandemic came around? No, and no one was really prepared that it might even happen in our lifetimes. But this is a perfect example of why it's never too late to start planning. 
brief few facts that I found recently, um, August of 2021, uh, so Wells Fargo did a disaster preparedness of their own, and they came to find out that many Americans are heavily reliant on their financial institutions to help prepare them for a disaster. It's not necessarily in their gamut. While they do provide emergency planning and tools, um, it's really, it's up to you to be prepared. The biggest area that they found a default is that 18 to 34 year old gap. And we know we have a lot of service members that fall in that age gap and they're just not prepared. Four in five Americans live in areas that have already experienced natural disasters. And if everybody's been paying attention to the news lately, we see that the natural disasters are not slowing down. I know this is a bit blurry and I'm sorry for that, but this graph was taken from the DOD report of effects of changing climates in 2019. So it looks at a 20 year vulnerability chart of things that are potentially gonna happen in the next 20 years. You can see Air Force is top heavy, but Navy is right up there in those double digits of things that you can experience and it has a greater probability of happening in your future. These are up here, just take it in for a second. These are all installations that these happened at. This first one is of, um, you see the service member with a dog. It's a rescue mission bringing pets from Hurricane Harvey to the reserve base in Fort Worth. The next one is Kessler Air Force Base. That was uh, Katrina. And then in the bottom is Homestead Air Force Base, Hurricane Andrew. All of these military sites, all of them impacting our military families. I wanted to do a five-year fact check. So I put in, since we're looking at sea services, our Marines, um, our submariners, our naval bases, and I tied them to different natural disasters. In the last five years alone, you can see we've had hurricane, hurricane, wildfires, earthquakes. We had a tornado hit a sub base. We've had lava flows. Our mid-Atlantic region, they're prone to coastal flooding and storm surges. We have so many different installations that are prone to natural disasters that it really does behoove us to become ready and prepared. Again, I wanna focus back on Tyndall. This wasn't too long ago, this is 2018. You can see the eye of the storm. It was projected to be a cat two. Within hours, it went to a cat five. By time it hit the panhandle and that coastal area, it was surging at such a capacity that 100% of Tyndall was destroyed. Their families were sent in various areas because it was short notice, so short that not even all of the F-22s had time to leave and broach damage. As of right now, this installation is still not at full capacity and does not expect to be until October of 2023. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Well, that's why we're here. We wanna help with the prevention. While hazardous earthquakes and tsunamis, floods and volcanoes do have the ability to destroy um, and they're not preventable, we can do our best in moving forward to plan and to work around them. Up next is my friend and colleague, Grandma Caldwell, and she's going to give you her brief bio and how she came into working with disasters. Rihanna? Hi, Sarah. Thank you. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Rihanna Caldwell. Um, I am a retired Air Force spouse. So my husband and I actually just uh, retired this past fall, and we settled uh, south of St. Louis. Uh, I have my bachelor's in Homeland Security with a minor in emergency management, and I've been on the uh, volunteer scene for about 10 years now and actively working in the field of emergency management for um, the past seven years. Um, I'm currently teaching incident command system for um, a local college uh, for the EMT and paramedic programs and also uh, our law enforcement academy recruits. And I sit on the safety and security board for the college, uh, which writes, reviews, and exercises uh, their emergency plans. So I wanted to begin by sharing um, a bit of an experience that I had. Uh, some of you may remember 
Uh, May of 2013, there was a massive EF5 tornado that blew through the town of um, Moore, Oklahoma. It injured uh, over 200 people and it kill, killed 24. Um, sadly, several children were also involved in that. Um, my husband and I received orders to Tinker Air Force Base, Oklahoma, and we arrived about six months after the tornado had gone through. And um, what we found was a community still reeling from the, the damages, both physical and emotional, and um, still very much in the middle of the recovery process. Um, I met several families who were still um, living in hotel rooms. Uh, some had just, um, at the six month mark, had just recently um, moved back into their homes or uh, began rebuilding their homes. Um, all were working through the insurance processes. Um, I was employed um, with the County Emergency Management Office and I sat on the recovery board. Uh, which was comprised of uh, local officials, um, some NGO reps from the Salvation Army, uh, American Red Cross, United Way, and then some local churches. Uh, the residents from the county were able to bring um, cases for monetary compensation and help get a little bit of financial aid. Um, things like tree and limb removal, uh, fence repair, uh, roof repair, things like that. and. Um, one interesting thing about it is uh, it was active the entire time that I lived there. We left in 2016 and the board was still meeting and providing monetary aid to uh, affected residents. And although it wasn't meeting as often, uh, it still was very much active. So I share that as an example of the length of time that it can take to recover from a major disaster. And um, as kind of an example as to why it's good to uh, take a few steps to repair. Uh, so with that, I have a few things I wanna share with you. Um, in the event of a disaster, there's kind of two eventualities. That you, may be, you may end up uh, sheltering in place or evacuating. So I'm gonna talk about a few things um, that you wanna do to prepare for each of those, um, each of those options. Um, Okay, so first of all, let's talk sheltering in place. Um, the first thing you wanna do is pay attention. There's three fields of view here. Um, you wanna pay attention to your immediate surroundings. And this, these are things that you can do to help uh, ensure your safety. Um, paying attention to your immediate surroundings will uh, keep you from getting swept up in a flash flood, um, help you uh, locate shelter if the weather turns on a dime, and even save you from um, an active shooter situation. Um, next, you wanna pay attention to what's going on in your local area. Check your weather forecast regularly. Um, activate weather alerts on your phone and maybe even uh, look at getting a weather radio um, to help alert you. Uh, sometimes some of these storms, they come through in the middle of the night uh, when we're sleeping. And so a weather radio is a really good idea to have on hand. Um, next, you want to pay attention to what's going on on the national and the global scale. And I added this in um, because uh, Sarah had some pictures of the food shortages that we went through uh, during the, the COVID uh, crisis. And um, we're still very much dealing with those. Um, supply chain issues are still an issue. There's some food shortages um, that have been forecasted. We've all seen gas prices fluctuate. Um, and then even inflation can affect how much uh, buying power your dollar can have and all take an impact on the family. So it's vitally important that we pay attention uh, to what's going on outside of our immediate purview. Um, next, you wanna gather some things um, and make sure you have all of your basic necessities on hand. And I'm specifically gonna talk about food and water, but depending on your family's needs, your kits, um, will probably need extra items. But on the food front, um, a good rule of thumb is a three-day supply um, to have on hand. Uh, don't forget your pets and small children when you're calculating your needs. Um, you can supply uh, your, uh, your emergency food kits with non-perishable items like uh, dried beans, pasta, canned goods, protein bars, and powders. With this, you wanna be aware of the expiration dates. Um, so 
uh, a good strategy is to buy a lot of the normal items, uh, buy items to uh, stock your emergency kit with the items that you would normally buy. That way you can rotate them out regularly. Um, another option is a emergency food kit. These are pretty awesome because they're good for up to 25 years. Um, sometimes when we think of these food kits, we think of like um, the hardtack bread of the Civil War era, but they've improved quite a bit over the years and there's lots of options that taste pretty good. And even if you have a restricted diet, um, there's lots of options out there that can navigate that. If you're unsure of as to whether or not that's something that you can stomach, some of these places uh, offer samples that you can order. So um, that's a good option out there. Um, all right, next, you wanna store water. The rule of thumb for water is a gallon per person per day. And again, don't forget your pets when you're doing your calculations. Water is good um, on the shelf for up to two years if it's unopened. However, if it's printed with uh, an expiration date on it, then you definitely wanna heed the, uh, take note of that and be cycling those those out before they expire. It's also a good idea to have a water filter on hand. Um, the most inexpensive and easily stored option is the water filter, the, uh, a water pitcher with a filter. These uh, filters, they can filter everything from bacteria to viruses, fluoride, and other common contaminants. Uh, so again, don't forget uh, pets and small children when you're doing your calculations for your basic needs. Um, lastly, it's a good idea to get to know your neighbors. Uh, the people in closest proximity to you when a disaster hits are your battle buddies. So it's just better to establish a connection uh, beforehand so you're not trying to do that in the middle of an emergency. All right, um, moving on to evacuation. So we all can probably agree that evacuation is not the most ideal situation. So there's a few things that you can do beforehand to, um, to set yourself up. Um, firstly, you wanna lay the groundwork early. Uh, think about places that you could go. Do you have family or friends that are located maybe a state or so away where you could go and stay with them, that they would be outside of a probable evacuation zone. If so, um, call them up and ask them if it would be okay um, if you stay with them, because um, obviously you're gonna be more comfortable there than you would be maybe in a shelter. Um, you also wanna make sure that your information is updated um, in your services accountability database, um, talking about NFAS, AFPAS, and the Army has their own database. This is how um, they identify uh, families that are, connect that are affected by the event, and it's also how they monitor the recovery process. So you definitely wanna make sure your details are up to date. Um, next, you wanna pack go bags for everyone in the household, including pets. The rule of thumb on this is uh, three-day supply. So things like toiletries, uh, changes of clothing, maybe some food items like uh, granola or nuts. Uh, don't forget your important documents and a uh, first aid kit is a good idea to have on hand. Ideally, you want to pack uh, a separate bag for each person in the house. And this is because your family is not always co-located. Uh, when a disaster strikes. Um, if you must go to a shelter, it's best to assume that they are going to have um, nothing except a roof over your head and a cot for you. So this means that you're gonna have to bring everything that you need. Um, that's your emergency supply kit that we just talked about uh, with your, your food and water and your go bags. Um, also think about comfort items like pillow, sleeping bag, maybe stuffed animals for children. This goes a long way for help, helping to comfort them um, when you're displaced. And a lot of times uh, shelters will not allow pets. Sometimes there's some allowances for um, registered comfort animals, but most of the times the pets will be processed and boarded separately. 
Um, so they're going to need their own kits, uh, their food, uh, collapsible bowls for feeding, definitely a crate and leash. And uh, don't forget their important documents like their shop records and microchip numbers and things like that. And I just wanted to um, leave you with this. It's been my experience in talking with people um, that there's a general feeling that things are fine and they always will be fine. But the fact is, is that over 200 million people a year are affected by disasters. And uh, the, there's been several studies, uh, up to 40% of us have done nothing to prepare. So um, hopefully some of the, the, the information that we provide here uh, will help convince you to get prepared um, so that you're able to react to what is, um, whatever is incoming uh, so that you can minimize the effects of a disaster and aid in, in the recovery. And the ultimate goal here is to get your family back to normal as, uh, as quickly as possible. So with that, I'll turn it back to Sarah. Thank you, Rihanna. So we're gonna go back and revisit some of these disasters. This was a huge one for people on the East Coast, this traffic jam that was caused by ice and snow. This was a headliner that I found on so many articles that I was looking up and it was, can you survive 15 hours or more in your car and what to prepare for winter emergencies? Well, not all of us are gonna be stranded in an area where there are winter emergencies, but it doesn't negate the fact that we can get stranded anywhere for any type of emergency. So AAA had put together a very comprehensive list of articles that should be in your car. Now, again, it's gonna depend on your locale. So if you're gonna be in an area that's more prone to storms and ice and things like that, you're gonna to wanna to keep more of those warmer um, necessities in your car and extras, extra thermals and whatnot. But there are basic, amenities that you should already keep in your car, like a cell phone charger, a basic first aid kit. And I think taking it one step higher than a basic first aid kit, um, something that's more uh, industrial and has bigger bandages, has antiseptics, just something to think about. Uh, water, snacks, protein bars, granola bars, non-perishables. You can stuff them in your um, in the back of your seat pockets. You can put them in your console. They don't take up a lot of space, but they come in when you are dying and you are stuck. You want to have a flashlight, something easy. You can put it in your glove box. Really, if you look at all of this, I know it can be overwhelming. Like, where am I going to put this in my car? But really, Really, these things can be tucked away in so many different spots that will help give you preparedness. But there are also remedial steps that can be taken to help you bring some security, peace, and assurance in the wake of chaos, destruction, um, emergencies, and just really the unknowns. So Rihanna talked about having those documents. Again, documents are so important. So my rule of thumb on this is to make sure that you have a copy of anything and everything you would need to start life over again. We don't know how long a disaster is going to last. We don't know how long it will take before we are allowed to get back home. Different instances like Tyndall, the families were evacuated to Virginia and Hawaii. The kids had to start school all over again. Tomodachi coming back from Japan, they needed to have all of those records readily available once they landed in Hawaii to get back on the mainland. So it's really important to have copies of these. You can find waterproof document holders and you can have a hard copy there, but highly encourage that you keep a digital copy. Download it onto a thumb drive, save it, email it to yourself. You can access your email anywhere you get to a safe spot. And also a great suggestion is to have a hard copy or a digital, again, thumb drive that you can mail to a reliable friend or family member that will be able to get you those documents when you get to a safe place. Following up for the animals, I recommend um, you have the rabies certificate or at least a copy of it and their microchip number. And you can put all those with your, um, your important documents, but you do have to have those in case you get separated from your, your animals. And you'd be surprised at how often that actually happens. 
have your insurance policy number and your insurance carrier. You're not going to remember that when you are in the height of stress and chaos, and you're going to be lucky if you can remember 911. So just go ahead and plug it in your phone so that you have that ready. Uh, these were emergency supplies that Rihanna went over. Um, they should just be a priority in your house really. So if you want to go ahead and screenshot this, this would be a great opportunity to. And uh, there's the disaster checklist that's put out by FEMA. It's pretty standard. Most of it you'll find on any website. I do recommend the true first aid. When I talked about going a little above and beyond with a first aid kit, this true first aid is really um, is field grade. It's all kinds of more medic like items that you would need. And depending on your disaster, you don't know what you might need or what you might encounter, but it has a lot of materials that you would find in CERT or wilderness experience. Um, the CDC has a list of availability. If you need to get emergency medicines, maybe you didn't have that ready, express scripts and TRICARE, you can notify them and let them know where you're at but also keep a list of what your prescriptions are in case you need to get that in the shelter somehow. Make sure that you have matches, that they're waterproof, anything that you would need to start a fire um, in or around your home. And someone taught this to me a while ago and it was beautiful and I keep it with me, but I keep mason jars full of lint. Lint is a great fire starter in an instant. That's why they always give you that promo about checking your lint traps and calling the fire department because it does start a fire. But it's just, it's something easy, something that you already have, you're already doing your laundry, keep a couple jars of it. It will help you later on down the line. And last, always have a can opener. Um, having put together thousands of food boxes in shelters and disseminating them. Food boxes do not come with can openers and not all cans are gonna be pop tops. So you wanna just make sure that you have one. They're simple, they're easy. You get them at Walmart, wherever, and toss them in your bag. I know preparing takes time to secure, rebuilding and finding your items that are needed um, often takes some time and some planning, but I promise you it is better to do that effort now because the planning, securing, and finding them on the other end will be virtually impossible and more expensive. Going back to our pet checklist, I have fur babies and I know so many of you do too. They are equally as important. If you are going to evacuate, take your pet with you. I can't underscore that enough. If they are domestic pets, they are reliant on you. You need to look out for them. So have a first aid kit for them. Most of those things you can find you know, at Walmart, you can find them online or even a pet store. They have um, small first aid kits, but you do wanna have something specifically for them um, and something that's pet safe as far as antiseptic, salines, tapes, things like that. You wanna make sure that your cell phone number is accurate and up to date. We PCS so often that sometimes we forget the smallest of things like upgrading our pets tags. So we want our, our pet to whoever finds them be able to locate us, but us to locate our pet as well. And again, that goes back to updating your information with your microchip. It's tedious every time you move but it really does help you if you do get separated from your animal. Um, animals can be found anywhere and they're hard to relocate and get back to their owner if no one knows who that owner is or where their owner was last. And again, keeping a food supply that will last for them. If you're preparing for three days, they need to have three days. If you're preparing for 12 days, then they need to have 12 days. And each pet needs to have their own designated water supply. <laughs> Um, this is just one last additional disaster checklist, and this one is for sheltering in place. Rihanna touched on it so great, but I just want to reiterate, it is to go in with the mindset that they are providing a shelter over your head. Some shelters have the ability and the funding to be able to provide you toiletry kits or get you some um, comfort items. But in general, they don't. Everybody is, is funded pretty much by donations or um, a limited supply. 
So when you go to the shelter, make sure you have a sleeping bag and linens. You can easily tuck in there, have some clothes. You want closed toed shoes, depending on what type of emergency you're dealing with. You don't wanna do anything that can cause extra hazard um, to yourself, to your family. And shower shoes, if you're in a, a shelter, everybody else is using the same, same shower. So you wanna have your own shoes. Um, Another thing that's really hard to come by in shelters are baby wipes and diapers. And those are usually the first things requested and the first things that go out. So keep an ample supply of both and make sure you're updating your diapers as your baby is continuing to progress. Have some cash. Pam is gonna talk more about that. Um, a utility, a multi-purpose tool is great. You often cannot take those into shelters, but you can keep those in your glove box. You want to know your evacuation routes and your shelter sites and rendezvous locations if you're going to go with a group or plan on meeting up with friends or family at an alternate site if you guys are caravanning together. Again, you want to make sure that you have a, a comfort bag. American Red Cross does a great excerpt on how to prepare a, a child for leaving for a disaster and how it gives them some ownership and control. And the more ownership and control, the less scary that that disaster becomes. And always another thing you can keep in your car, you can tuck in wherever. Trash bags are godsends depending on your disaster and where you're going because they can keep yourself dry and keep your belongings dry. And if not, um, you have some place to put all your trash that you're now collecting, whether you're sheltering or, or not. So going into this, um, I just want to remind you again, the military's primary focus is always on mission readiness. That includes accountability of their machines and their service members. It's not to say that they don't care about you, but this is a reminder, you are not their first priority. So you need to keep reviewing these things for you, for your family, for your community. Another important side of disasters is the financial awareness of this. So I'm going to turn this over to Pam and she's going to introduce herself and kind of go over information that is also pertinent. You have to unmute Pam. I knew I was going to do that. This is awesome information. I hope I can add value to the presentation. I've been in the field of military financial readiness for 22 years now, eight years with Navy Fleet and Family Support, and now about 14 years with Army Community Service. Not only am I a military financial readiness specialist, but I lived on the Mississippi Gulf Coast when Hurricane Katrina hit in August of 05. So I have that added perspective on disaster preparedness. When Katrina hit, we had already evacuated for four other named storms within the previous 12 months. My boys were two and six at the time, and their dad was on a ship off the Ivory Coast of Africa. I remember going to sleep on Saturday night thinking the storm was headed for Pensacola. I woke up to a phone call from my neighbor. She said, it's a category five and it's headed straight for us. We packed a couple changes of clothes and got out of there. We had our emergency papers folder, and I also had a video recording of all our worldly possessions inside the house and garage. At the time, there were no reimbursements for hurricane evacuations, but more recently, when Hurricane Matthew hit us in Savannah, all DOD, service, DOD civilians and service members were put on emergency travel orders so that when we returned, we were reimbursed for food, gas, and hotel expenses but we still needed cash or credit to pay these expenses up front. So it's important to have a credit card with credit available. And remember when you opened your first credit card, you probably told yourself like I did, we'll have this card for emergencies, but then we used it for oh so much more. If your card happens to be near its limit and you're not paying it off every month, I encourage you to change a few spending habits and pay that card off. You'll save yourself some money on interest charges and have a card available if you should have to evacuate from your home on a moment's notice. But also cash is important. The financial planning gurus that I follow recommend we have six months worth of income in an emergency savings account. 
When a new client comes to me and they have no emergency savings, we set a goal to have two months worth set aside as soon as possible. It may take them 12 months or more to accumulate that, but it will be a satisfying accomplishment when it's done. And then it's easier to work on other financial goals because you never know when a storm or fire or flood or even cyber attack will prevent us from using our credit cards. So during my evacuation from Hurricane Katrina, I was in Memphis, Tennessee, when I learned our hometown was pretty well devastated. So I needed to bring my boys to a safe haven, they called it. I decided to bring them up to my folks in upstate New York. I remember I was at Crazy Charlie's Gasoline and Fireworks Station in Memphis, I put my card in at the pump and it allowed me to pump something like two cents worth of gas. And then it turned off. Now there were rumors that gas was gonna be rationed because there were so many oil rigs damaged in the Gulf. So I went in and asked about that and the cashier got right on the phone with Crazy Charlie. Who told her, no, they're not rationing gas. And then she suggested I call my bank. I was able to reach a live representative at Keesler Credit Union on my cell phone. And she said, we noticed purchases in Memphis, Tennessee, outside your normal area and tried to call you, but because we couldn't reach you, we froze your card. They only had my home phone number on file at the time. Three lessons learned. One, when you travel, even on an emergency evacuation, Give your bank or credit union information about where you'll be. Second, keep your phone number updated with your bank or credit union. And third, always carry cash when you leave home. In the case of an emergency evacuation, try to withdraw enough to pay for gas and food and lodging for your family for at least two days. So going back one slide, we have some general rules of thumb when it comes to managing money. Despite the housing debacle in the 0708 timeframe, big banks are still over lending to American consumers. So it's our job to crunch the numbers and be sure we can afford a new mortgage, for example, with taxes and insurance and homeowner association fee and yard upkeep and potential maintenance, et cetera. Or crunch the numbers to be sure we can afford another car loan before we go out shopping or a furniture loan, or whatever it may be we're thinking of purchasing on credit. Go to your nearest family service office on base and let them help you, or at least ask for a spending plan template, then you can do it yourself. Too many of us still think that if the bank approves us, we are able to afford this new thing that we're getting on credit. That is wrong. They're not seeing our big picture. Only we know what that is. So we have to crunch the numbers ourselves. One of our, my favorite financial planning gurus says, if you want to be well off, never take on a mortgage more than twice your annual gross income. Or three times if you're in a high cost of living area like Miami. <laughs> if you have a dual income household, figure twice the higher salaried member's income is the maximum mortgage or three times in a higher cost of living. We already talked about having six months worth of income in an emergency savings account. What can you do if there is no emergency savings and you have an emergency? We want your first resource to be the emergency relief office on base, be it Navy Marine Corps Relief, Army Emergency Relief, Air Force Aid or Coast Guard Mutual Assistance. I've seen it happen many times lately with uh, disasters declared or evacuations declared in a military area. These agencies will issue a blanket authority for the providers to give five to $600 per military family to help with evacuation expenses. So be listening for that if a disaster, heaven forbid, strikes near you. On the next slide, Upon your return home after the disaster, weigh your options. Do you wanna stay and rebuild or are you able to go somewhere else and start fresh? After Katrina, my house had about $14,000 worth of damage to the roof and sidings and soffits. And I ended up selling it as is when I was able to find another financial readiness position in Texas. Had I stayed, I would have waited a long time for a contractor to do my repairs. 
At the time Katrina hit, there were still homes in the Pensacola area that had blue roofs from Hurricane Ivan, which had made landfall 12 months earlier. Maybe you have a handyman in the house who could do the repairs, but I didn't. So set goals for yourself. Without goals, we have very little incentive to do things differently. For example, let's rehab this house within the next three months. We can do it ourselves, or we're gonna sell and PCS in six months, or let's sell it as is and just move a couple of towns over where the disaster didn't affect the area so much. All of these goals involve spending less and chunking your money at a line item that was probably not on your budget before the disaster hit. Insurance never quite covers everything. I had a flood years after Katrina outside of Savannah because a pipe burst under my house and insurance covered about one third of the actual cost to get my house back the way I wanted it. It took near, I took nearly $10,000 out of pocket. Make a plan, step-by-step, step, lay out how you're gonna achieve your goals, picture the end result, and you'll stay motivated. After Katrina, many people had a hard time recovering emotionally because of what they saw or what they experienced. So resilience is important no matter where you are in life. And this is an important uh, class within military family readiness. Bend, don't break is what my favorite yogi likes to say. It's important to stay fit, but not just physically, mentally, emotionally, and socially as well, so that you can weather the storm if it comes your way. My mother used to say, oh, honey, just trudge on through it. You'll, you can do it. Sort of like that which does not kill us only makes us stronger. Better days are ahead. Remember these things. But also use your great, wonderful military resources, especially the financial counselors at Family Services. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for all that great information. I think all too often that people don't factor in and calculate enough of the financial readiness and the financial implications that any emergency, whether natural, man-made, um, storm, or just occasion comes into play. And then they're often lost for what to do and what comes next. So thank you for pointing out resources and thank you for just going over all of these things that are really so important and the other leg to preparedness. So as mentioned in the beginning, this is a list of resources, recommendations, and registries. This is another great opportunity for you to screenshot. Um, they are all vettable, viable, different resources. A lot of them are mil.gov. Um, Rihanna did talk about going to your different agencies, whether that's NFAAS, whether it's AdPass, whether it, whatever it is for your location and making sure that your registry is up to date. Sometimes you can do that on your own. And I have learned that that really depends on whoever is in charge of that installation. Often more times than not, your service member or your CAC holder needs to be the one to be able to go in and facilitate that. I really do encourage, not nag, but encourage that you encourage them to go make sure that that is up to date because that's really going to be such a vital importance. If you do have to evacuate, it's the accountability measure to make sure your families are taken care of. But again, it goes back to that priority. If the ships have to sortie, if the planes have to leave, that gives the peace of mind to your service member of your location, what your evacuation plan is. Um, and it really does, it brings that peace of mind. Other vital resources that are always helpful, readynavy.mil, Military One Source. They have a great list of materials that you might need. TRICARE, TRICARE is always important. If you have to leave in the middle of a disaster, maybe you're going to a different region, give them a heads up. And another thing that I feel is incredibly important because we are so transient is to get involved with your community. Locate where 
my favorite Salvation Army, but the Red Cross, um, where your animal shelters or your food pantries are at, these are all going to be vital services in the recovery and response portions. And when you are coming back, if you're coming back to your home and location, that and it's great for building and your bridging community, you're making sure that you know where you can go afterwards and if you need help, but also um, letting the these agencies know that the military family members want to be involved. It's, it's great on every level. There are opportunities to volunteer, to donate your time and monies and resources. I'm sure that many of you have questions by now. And if you do, that's great. I encourage you to email message or leave comments on Facebook or reach out to the Naval Services Family Line. Um, for the rest of you, perhaps you have questions about your own preparedness and what that might look like. First, you need to have the basics, which we've listed previously. Next, you need to figure out what your location is prone to, whether that's coastal floodings and nor'easters, typhoons, hurricanes, wildfires. And then I encourage you to reach out to your installation's emergency management and readiness officer. Every installation has one. And this is not your ombudsman. While your ombudsman is there to help direct you, the emergency management readiness officer is trained for the protocols and the installation's policies, what to do in case of emergency. They will help direct you. Um, you can follow up with the service and related locations with an easy Google search. Just put in where your location is, especially if you're PCSing, what it is prone to, what activities are going around, and that'll give you a baseline where to start, things that you should have and be ready for, whether it's sheltering in place, going to a shelter, evacuation. This is a great time to investigate, like I said, your NGOs, like your Salvation Army, your Red Cross, your Southern Baptist, your animal shelters and food pantries, so that you're comfortable and you can see what they suggest for your area as well. So in wrapping up, I wanna thank all of you for taking your time and being with us as we help prepare you and your families for emergency preparedness now and in the future. In summarization, while we do highlight important information and websites, especially those put out by Big Navy, they are not the end-all be-all. They rather are stepping stones to helping you acquire preparedness in your own journeys. We believe in empowering military families with what they need to know when they are the ones on the home front, as most are not afforded the luxury of having their active duty spouse at home with them during such arduous times. Preparedness empowers you. The Navy encourages all personnel and their families to maintain a basic level of preparedness for all potential hazards. You are highly encouraged to be informed before, during, and after any incident. Make a written family emergency plan. Have ICE. ICE is your in case of emergency contacts and build a basic emergency supply kit as put out by CNIC Navy. Thank you for again having this time with us. And now I'm going to turn everything back over to Stacy. Thank you guys. <clears throat> Clear my throat. Okay. Ladies, Pam, Sarah, Rihanna, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your time with us this evening and the amazing information you provided. I wrote down in big letter, uh, big words here on my notes, plan, prepare, be aware. Like that's what I took from this. I also wanna add my own tip because I do a bed in a bag and I do sheets, a blanket and a pillow with fabric softeners. And I put them all in those big vacuum pack bags. So they suck down nice. So. It's a fresh little bed in a bag. So there's Stacey Harris's little version of being prepared. I, I, I'm prepared for whatever guests might show up at my house, but I figured I could use that for you guys as well. Um, great, great information, especially as we head into the summer season. We know that is kind of the kickoff to a lot of weather related disasters, but good value for this hour with you ladies tonight. Um, I want to encourage everybody to stay tuned. We have a part two in the month of June and we're calling it living a prepared military life. So we're going to follow up with lots of tips and great advice, um, many of which we've um, 
captured from tonight's event. So please follow us along on our social media and that will all be coming out in the month of June. And again, my name is Stacey Harris. I am the director of the CORE program. This is a global CORE presentation and we are all part of the wonderful family of Naval Services Family Line. So have a great afternoon or evening or whenever you have the opportunity to watch this and stay tuned for more great information. Thank you everybody.